Engine Repair 2 Test 9 from Chapter 19. Two technicians are discussing clogged DGR passages. Technician A says clogged DGR passages can cause excessive NOx emissions. Is that true? What side does it print on when I put it I have no clue. You'll have to find out. I mean, I never can remember that. I just stick it in there. If it don't print right, I put it in the other way. No, that's fairly no brainer. Um, technician B says clogged DGR passages can cause engine to ping. Uh, so, to both questions, can clogged DGR passages cause NOx emissions to increase? They probably can because what's the EGR on there for? <laughs> Zach, shut up. What's the EGR on there for? EGR is on there to Please. EGR is on there to recirculate some exhaust gas to cool the combustion chamber so you don't make oxides of nitrogen. If you put some inert gas in there, back when I was working in a wall patch, if somebody had something, you know, a drum that had had something in it that would burn, it was explosive, like if it had gasoline or it's full of lacquer thinner or whatever, what they do is they take the exhaust pipe off, off of their pickup and they put a hose on that exhaust pipe on their pickup and they stick it in that hole on that drum and just let that truck run for a while and then what was in that drum would not burn. And then they could actually get a torch and cut a drum open that had had lacquer thinner or something in it without blowing themselves to smithereens. Can I say that again? Okay, they would, they would take... No, not that. Uh -huh. EGR. Okay, EGR, you're basically, exhaust gas is inert. It won't burn, right? Okay. It's like something it won't burn. Right. You add a little bit of that to the combustion chamber, and it causes the combustion chamber not to burn quite so hot. You're trying to keep the combustion chamber temperature below 2,500 degrees so that it won't make oxides of nitrogen. Because this is 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen. When it gets over that temperature, they lock together in all these oddball nitrogen-oxygen compounds. We don't want that. You got me? So EGR is actually keeping it below 2,500 degrees. It only flows when the engine is warm and you're cruising. It doesn't flow at idle. It doesn't flow at wide open throttle. And that kind of thing. I've heard it. I've heard it. Yeah, you've heard me say that before. Okay, but when EGR, you got to think about why is EGR on there? It's to keep it from forming oxides of nitrogen, which only form at really high temperatures. Technician B says clogged EGR passages can cause the engine to ping. Yes, it can. Why would an engine ping if EGR passages were clogged? The temperature. If the temperature goes high, you're going to get ping. That means the gas is going to light off too soon. I mean, the gas is going to light off on temperature instead of spark. If it lights off too soon, it actually causes that explosion goes through there and it smacks the top of the piston and it kind of rings it like a bell. So you're hearing it's like somebody banging on the piston with a hammer. Now, it doesn't actually make dents in a piston. It gets bad enough, it can burn a hole in it, but uh, that doesn't usually happen. You're going to hear a little bit of ping or, or you know, clink, clink, clink. People call it valve clatter for years, but it's actually, you know, what's going on in the combustion chamber or combustion. But anyway, that particular one is C. Both those guys are right. Number two, an EGR valve that's partially stuck open would most likely cause what position? Remember, what condition? A little, excuse me. Yeah, an EGR valve that is partially stuck open would most likely cause what? Rough idle. Rough idle, that's right. You see me open that EGR valve on these vehicles out here and they just run like a dog. Anything that's common to all of the cylinders. Whenever you got an engine that's running rough, I want to know, is it one cylinder that it's missing on or is it missing on all of them some? And if it's something that's common to all the cylinders and you got EGR flowing, obviously you found your trouble. You can hook your vacuum gauge up. If the valve's timing is out, it'll make it run lousy because it'll be pretty much common to all cylinders. If you've got bad gas, like water in the gas or something like that, it's actually going to cause that trouble too. Okay, how much air flows through the PCV system when the engine is idling? Now, that's a hard question, isn't it? Up to 30%. Now, the positive crankcase ventilation is basically pulling the, you got a vacuum, like let's just draw two valve covers here. We're going to make it real simple. Draw two valve covers. Obviously, there's an engine underneath all this. All right, now I'm going to draw an air cleaner up here, and I'm going to put a hose right here. It's just an open hose up here for the air cleaner, and I'm going to put, coming off the manifold, I'm going to have my PCV valve in there, and I'm going to be drawing vacuum through that crankcase. There's air going to be coming all the way through there all the time. You're constantly ventilating the crankcase, but none of that is making it to the atmosphere. Every bit of it is going through the combustion chamber and being used. Now, if this here quits working, where does all of that 
uh, pressure go. There's back pressure in there, blow by that goes by the rings whenever the engine pistons are coming up. Some of that black, that goes by the rings and it gets in the crankcase and it basically, if this clogs up and it's not pulling anymore, as far as there, like I said, sometimes it'll clog up under here, sometimes it'll clog up in there. That's PCV now. Don't get PCV and EGR confused, right? And all that steam and everything is going to go the other way. Now this same stuff is all steam and everything is what wafts around in your intake and clogs up EGR passages and clogs up the around the throttle plate and all that kind of hogwash. That's, that PCV system is, has been a problem ever since they put it on there. But it didn't used to be as bad when there was a carburetor always washing out the inside of the intake. But when they quit putting carburetors on there, well then they had throttle bodies like your truck's got and it was still washing out the inside of the intake. Then they moved the injectors right down there behind the valves and all of a sudden now the intake don't have anything flowing through it except air and there's steamy stuff that comes out of the PCV system. When you shut it off, there's no vacuum flowing. That intake's going to fill up with all this steamy, I mean, this sort of, you know, vaporized oil and all this hogwash that's out of the crankcase, and it sort of sweats on the inside of the manifold, and it stays there. And over time, it sort of cleans up. That's why you got this upper intake cleaning that people talk about, where you miss some stuff through there and let it melt that off, you know. So that's something a lot of people don't think about. But uh, PCV is really important, but PCV causes problems. Now, there is people that have designed little filters little PCV filters to prevent that kind of thing. But they don't, I mean, I don't know of a commercial supplier of those. Uh, I'm not saying there's not one, I'm just saying I don't know one. Technician A says if a PCV valve rattles, it's okay and doesn't need to be replaced. Uh, technician B says a PCV valve does not rattle, it should be replaced. Who's right about that? That's number four. That's a B. It doesn't necessarily mean the PCV valve is okay just because it rattles. You know what I mean? I mean, just uh, that sounds good, but it don't wash, you know, so... Um, just, you got a it's a PCV valve doesn't cost very much, and it's typically you all, you you guys all know what a PCV valve looks like, don't you? That ain't no big deal. It's not rocket science. Every, just, every engine's got a PCV system on it. Not every system has a PCV valve on it though. I'm gonna tell you that some of these little Asian cars and that Jeep I had, they didn't have a PCV valve per se like you're saying that would rattle and all. They just had a little orifice that popped into the valve cover. And you just pull a little vacuum through there all the time. Now that little silly thing likes to stop up. Uh, but anyway, the long and the short of it is, it, some of the PCV valves are hard to get to on uh, that little little Ford Contour they used to make with a little four-cylinder car. They had the PCV valve mounted down there behind the catalytic converter in front of the motor, which was kind of stupid. It should rattle. Huh? So should it should rattle, but I don't necessarily mean it's good. If it don't rattle, you know it's bad. So that's one, of, that's one of them tests that if it fails the test, you know it's bad. But if it doesn't, if it still if it rattles, that don't mean it's good. You get where I'm going? That's where it's, because yeah, it can have other problems. Uh, it can have a broke spring in it or something. All right, but uh, anyway, um, let's see. The switching valves on an air injection reactor pump have failed several times. Technician A says a defective exhaust check valve could be the cause. Technician B says leaking exhaust system and the muffler could be the cause. We need to talk about that for a minute. Okay. Uh, everybody should know by this time that there are, your, your exhaust stream is not just a steady flow of air. Your exhaust stream has got pulses because you've got, you know, valves opening and closing and it's basically pulsing air through the exhaust. Okay, so what they do is, I need a better mark for this one here. Wow. All right, this one right here, you got a, you got a little check valve in here and it's got a hose going to it. And this check valve, there's a pipe coming off your exhaust. All right, this is just hooked directly into the exhaust stream. You know, somewhere there'll be a pipe curving up there. And this check valve here has got a place for a hose to go in there. And inside here, it's got a little sort of a diaphragm affair so that those exhaust pulses cannot push exhaust heat up in there, right? You got me. You don't want to. You don't want to exhaust heat going up. The only place you're wanting any uh, anything to travel is from your air pump. Your air pump is actually producing air, and your air pump wants to put air in here. But there's a valve up here that sort of diverts it. You know, one way and then the other. You know, so it's actually going to send it one way sometimes and the other way sometimes. We'll talk about that again in a minute. This little check valve right here is only supposed to let air go in. It's not supposed to let anything come out. Because obviously if any exhaust comes out of there, 
this little plastic diverter valve up here is going to melt. It ruins it. If you keep melting these valves up here, you know this darn thing's bad. You got yeah, me? That's an air valve then? Yeah, that valve right there so that's is the actually a valve. You know those big hoses that look like heater hoses that are coming from the air pump? You ever seen them? They ain't got nothing flowing through them but air. Uh, whenever the engine's cold, well, you know, long and short of it is on the earlier, like when that Bronco out there, you're going to pump air upstream through a check valve, and you're basically going to put that in there so that whenever the engine is running rich and it's cold, it'll put some oxygen in there to join itself to those hydrocarbons. It's kind of like fanning a dying fire. You know, when you fan a fire, it gets hot again. All right, so you put oxygen molecules in the exhaust when the engine's cold and it's running rich, and that takes care of the hydrocarbon problem when it's cold. All right, after the engine warms up, this valve diverts. There's a couple of diverter valves on it usually. This valve diverts and it sends it downstream, down to the uh, where it goes in there between the two bricks and the catalyst, and that would make it enable it to. The first brick is your light off brick, and it takes care of oxides of nitrogen, breaks them back apart into oxygen and nitrogen. The second one down there actually adds a molecule of oxygen a couple of molecules of oxygen to hydrocarbons, one molecule of carbon monoxide, so it'll come out as carbon dioxide. But the air pump, you got to inject some air into the exhaust to make that happen. Got me? Okay, so anytime you see an air pump, whether it's spun by a belt or whether it's electric, it's there to protect care, uh, help with exhaust emissions. That's what that's the whole purpose of it. And they need to know it's working, so whenever the thing's testing it for a rationality test, it will open the valve and it'll dump some upstream oxygen in there, and when it dumps some, it, close that door over there. and. Uh, and it's not really all that uh, hot in here today, so Willie, really turn off that air so we're not all, you know, we'll see Melissa's cold and everything. And it doesn't, it's not. But uh, anyway, uh, skinny boy there, he's probably cold. That's yeah, all right. Well, I'm not, don't need it. I'm not hot, you know. Y'all ain't hot, are you? you know, it's cool outside. Uh, but anyway, um, this is fall, okay? Um, now then, um, what we got here, just be, be perfectly knowledgeable about this as you can. Uh, whenever you're putting air into the exhaust, you're going to have to have something there to keep the exhaust from getting into the air. You understand? Now, this is not the same air that is the engine breathing. It's got a separate air pump, which is either electric or belt driven, that's producing this airflow that is being directed into the exhaust for, to take care of exhaust emissions. And it's all about after the fact. It's everything is, after the engine is done and the exhaust is leaving, this helps to take care of those gases, either by pumping it to the catalytic converter or just pumping it directly into the exhaust stream. And one of the things that, it, there's another diverter that dumps it into the atmosphere on most of these vehicles, like on the Bronco out there, so that when you let off, it diverts to the atmosphere, the, the air pump's still spinning, but you might even have heard that noise under the hoods of some vehicles where it'll go when you let off. And I'm not talking about those diesel with a jake brakes, but you know what I'm talking about. It'll, like, it'll dump it into the atmosphere, because if you put oxygen in the exhaust when you're letting off it'll backfire or it'll make a little it'll either go boop, 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 or it'll go boom you know it'll pop so you don't want air going in. and when we used to have one that would backfire out the exhaust we'd check that air management system and make sure that all these diverter valves were working like they're supposed to a lot of times somebody just left a vacuum line loose because they're all vacuum operated typically uh, but anyway uh, that's something you need to study up on guys there is a chapter in this chapter in that book there's a part that, that places in that book that talks about the air management system. You didn't know why that's there because you're going to be troubleshooting it at some point. Um, and, all that. and a lot of them have got pure old, just a little old, it almost looks like an accumulator, but there'll be a little vacuum pump that's electric and it's got a relay drive in it and everything. So just keep that, uh, that's part of, this is actually more of an emission control thing, but it's related to engine repair too. All right, let's go down here. Uh, number five is basically the one we just said, that's A. If the air uh, pump has failed several times, you know, uh, well, let me look at this. Yeah, technician A, a leak in the exhaust system at the muffler is not going to cause these little plastic switching valves on the air management system to fail. So A is the only one that's right on that one. Two technicians are discussing a catalytic converter. Technician A says a vacuum gauge can be used to observe see if vacuum drops to the engine at 2,500 RPM for 60 seconds. If you pull that thing up to 2,500 RPM for 60 seconds, and this, you know, this was a, one of the tests you can do to see if your catalyst is clogged. Hold it at 2,500 RPM for a minute, and that, if the vacuum, you know, initially, what does the vacuum do when you first crack a throttle? If it's unloaded, you know, it starts out like that at 20. You crack a throttle and it bounces back to 20. It'll drop and then bounce back to 20. You keep holding it for 2,500, 
if it begins to fall off when you're holding it steady, then you know that your the exhaust is backing up at the catalytic converter and the engine can't breathe as good. See where I'm going with that? Now on Melissa's car, what we did is I had that little fitting, that little 18 millimeter uh, fitting that I had got out of an old an exhaust system and I bought. Uh, I bought a catalytic converter and it had an 18 millimeter plug in it where the oxygen sensor was supposed to go. I drilled through that, put a fitting in there, we put a hose on it, and we checked it with a gauge. She does not have a stopped up exhaust system because she didn't have but like one pound of, of back pressure. Now, if her exhaust system had been stopped up, anytime I've ever seen that, it pegs that gauge. Wham! It goes halfway around. Uh, hers didn't have any problem with that. So that way you, you put this exhaust system problem to rest. It's over. You don't worry about the exhaust system anymore. Look for your problem somewhere else because your exhaust system, if you've checked that pressure, you know. But the vacuum, the way the engine breathes, you can tell too. Looking at that gauge, if you hold it up there and that gauge begins to fall off, pretty good idea. A lot of the times, if you crack, if you just, if you snap a throttle, it'll stay down. You know, uh, you're basically talking about a sliding scale here. It can be slightly stopped up, or it can be bad stopped up, or it can be completely stopped up. Uh, the more stoppage there is, the easier it is to troubleshoot. Unless it gets so bad that the car won't even start, and then you'd be having trouble. That's when you pull half the plugs out and see if it fires up. Okay, so number six, uh, that's basically going to be C. Technician A says vacuum gauge can be used. Technician B says a pressure gauge can be used. That's what we did on your car yesterday. And so that's basically going to be C. You can use them both on there. You can also use a temperature gun, but that's not 100%. If it fails it, fine, but if it passes it, that don't mean it's good. Uh, what about at, at what temperature does oxygen combine with the nitrogen in the air to form the oxygen? What did I say? 2,500 degrees is the point at which it does that. A P0401 diagnostic trouble stowed is being discussed. Technician A says a stuck closed EGR valve could be the cause. He's right, it could. Mm -hmm. Technician B says clogged EGR port could be the cause. That's what I was telling you yesterday. Which technician is correct? And that's going to be both of them. All right, now then, which evaporative valve is normally closed? EVAP valve. Now, basically, the EVAP system is like what we've got up here. You see that? See that thing up on the, that little demonstration? The evaporative system is basically whenever you're wanting to see if you've got a good tight system where there's no gas fumes leaking into the atmosphere. That's what that's about up there that, and, uh, whenever you're checking the gas tank. And the evaporative system traps that vapor and then cycles it through the intake. See, the engine is really good for processing stuff like uh, like PCV and of course EGR is actually you're not really processing anything except keeping the emissions down but then you're also processing this evaporating gasoline you can pull it in there too uh, but that's what that is. So which one is normally closed uh, would it be the canister purge valve, the canister vent valve, both of them or neither? Mm. Okay we got in order to understand that you got to know how the evaporative system works if the evaporative system uh, decides that it wants to start evaporating the canister, it's going to start opening the canister purge valve. The canister purge valve is not always open. The canister vent valve is always open if they're at rest. If they're at rest, the purge valve is closed, the vent valve is open. When it starts using them, they go opposite. Like for instance, if it wants to check and see if you've got a hole in the gas tank or a hose leading to the gas tank, it's letting air pressure out you know, with gas fumes in it, you know, up to 20,000 of an inch hole, it's actually going to close the vent valve and it's going to apply a vacuum to the tank, you know, using the uh, EVAP valve, and it's going to watch a pressure sensor, and when it closes them off, it wants to see if that pressure leaks back up. If it does, then you got to... But it also wants to see if, when it puts pressure on there, if it, when it opens the vent valve, the pressure goes away. It can throw a code because of that, too. If the canister is stopped up with dust... It'll throw you a code telling you, I put vacuum on the tank. When I released it, it didn't go anywhere. And that's something that's also a, a bad situation. Is everybody clear on the answer on that? Number nine, the canister purge valve is the one that's normally closed. Get that stuff burned in. This is a pretty good little chapter here because it's running heavy into emission stuff, and that's going to strengthen what you're learning in the course that we teach on Thursday. Uh, before an evaporative emission monitor will run, the fuel level must be where? Anybody know? Actually, it's got to be between 15 and 85. If so, like I think my wife always has me fill up her Explorer when it's a, before it gets to three quarters of a tank. You know what I mean? If it's still above, and, and she probably her system probably hadn't checked its evaporative since the last time we drove the thing at Hattiesburg. You know what I mean? Uh, so uh, if it's below, if some also if somebody's driving around with their tank on empty all the time, it will never check the evaporative system. This is one of the monitors that only works when certain conditions are met. See what I'm saying? 
This is one that has to be, and this is one that it's the hardest to get this one to, to run. Like if you fix an evaporative problem and you drive it down the road trying to get it to clear that monitor, sometimes it's a booger bear getting it to do that because uh, you've got to meet those conditions and a lot of stuff's got to be just right. The purpose of the evap system is to trap gasoline vapors, also called what? What do you call that? That's actually going to call it, uh, you know, they're calling it VOC. I like to call it hydrocarbons. That's what, that's what I like to call it. Um, yeah, technician A says a carbon, uh, parentheses, charcoal canister, is used to trap gasoline vapor, trap and hold until they can be purged and run into the engine to be burned. Technician B says the purpose of the evaporative emission control system is to reduce the release of a volatile organic compounds, which is what VOC stands for, uh, into the atmosphere. And which technician is correct? Charlie. By the way, did you know that uh, the oil, and I was reading about this the other day, the oil that is trapped underground, you know, where the people, where we pump the oil out to get gas from our car, uh, if the earth was as old as they say it was, that oil wouldn't be there because bacteria eats oil. And it's something, it has to be young. The earth's got to be young because if it wasn't, the oil wouldn't be there. <laughs> we wouldn't have any oil. You know. As a matter of fact, they dump bacteria when they spill oil on those water in those ditches down at, at Texaco, you know, the refineries where I used to live. They got some bacteria they dump in there that eats that oil. They can dump that on there, that oil just goes away. <laughs> uh, now then, I don't know if the bacteria can live in salt water. Or that, I don't know if they, use, if they don't use it out there. On the, you know what I'm saying? But I mean, I, there's a reason why they don't use it out there, but I don't know what it is, you know. But they use it down there, uh, and I know for a fact they, they do that. But anyway, the, this uh, parts washer uh, stuff that we got has actually got some bacteria in it, too, that, of that type that eats oil. You know what I mean? So uh, don't just shake your hands off and eat your sandwich, okay? You need to clean your hands up, okay? But All right, now then, let me see here. Uh, number 12, we already answered. That was C. All of these can increase the pressure in the evaporative system except what? All of these can increase the evaporative system pressure except A. Returned fuel from the fuel injection system. B. Inlet fuel to the fuel pump. C. Fuel temperature. D. Read vapor pressure of the fuel. That's just B. Inlet to the fuel pump. That's not going to What's going to happen there? It's actually going to pull, you know, pressure out of there, isn't it? Uh, which of these substances are uh, used in vapor canisters can absorb volatile, volatile organic compounds? Desiccant carbon, yeah, carbon. Uh, likes gravitate toward likes, you know, carbon goes to carbon. It's basically like it is. Technician A says, uh, EGR is usually not needed at idle, not wanted at wide open throttle for maximum engine performance or when the engine is cold. He's right. Technician B says oxides of nitrogen are formed inside the combustion chamber when the heat exceeds 4,500 degrees. You know, that's a falsy there. We've already been there. All right. Let me... All right. Okay. Now then, um, let's see. Exhaust gas recirculation is not generally needed under all the following conditions except what? In other words, it's going to, what's the only place when you're going to have EGR? It's going to be cruise speed. It won't happen at idle, it won't happen at cold engine, it won't happen at wide open throttle. You know I mean? Technician A says recirculating 6 to 10% inert exhaust gas back into the intake system increases peak temperature. It doesn't increase that, it reduces it. That's wrong. Technician B says vacuum operated EGR valves are usually exhaust back pressure control to help match EGR flow. To, in the intake with the load on the engine. Now, that guy is right. Uh, General Motors and Ford started doing that way back when, basically. And whenever you would, you could basically, uh, like even on that uh, Toyota, you can actually sometimes, on not every EGR valve, the one on yours, you can, the one on yours you can actually control with a scan tool. You can make it open and watch and see if it does. Cause that one on hers has got five wires going to it. Two of them operate the motor, and three of them are, you know, like your reference voltage, your uh, signal, and your and your signal return. And so, if you can go in there and go into active test mode and open the EGR valve here, see if the engine runs rough. It'll tell you the the little pedal position sensor is going to tell you if it's open. And if you listen to the way the engine's running, you can tell 
if there's actually exhaust flow in. It can open and the exhaust can't flow if it's, or it won't flow if it's clogged. That'll throw you your EGR code right there. Okay, so that's something you can learn from that. Okay, um, let's see. Number 17 is basically B. Technician A says many EGR systems use a feedback potentiometer to signal PCM about the position of the EGR valve pedal. That's what I was talking about. Hers having the Broncos also got one of these. It's a linear potentiometer. Technician B says some EGR valves use solenoids that are pulse width modulated to control the pencils. Who's right about that? That's C. Both those guys are right. What causes the nitrogen and oxygen to combine to form oxides of nitrogen? B. B. Heat above 2,500 degrees. If you don't remember anything else out of this session, you'll remember that, won't you? Technician A says a low restriction exhaust system could prevent a back pressure type modul uh, vacuum controlled EGR valve from opening. Like if somebody in, in, in this part of the country where we don't have emission testing, uh, sometimes they'll slice the catalytic converters off one and just put straight pipes on it. And then they'll get a code. And then our EGR valve will be there. You know, I mean, another rule. EGR code will be there. There's not enough back pressure to let the EGR work, but a computer doesn't like the fact that the EGR is not working, and so it's going to throw you a code on some vehicles. Technician B says a restricted exhaust can cause the EGR valve position, uh, position sensor to fail. Uh, who's right about that? C's right. Both of them guys are right about that. Um, I, t I told that little thing about uh, back in the olden days, the carburetors, like this carburetor on this engine out here, has what you call ported vacuum. One of the vacuum outputs on that carburetor is ported vacuum. What ported vacuum is, and some of your fuel-injected engines have it too, you'll have a vacuum port coming off the throttle body or the carburetor that only has vacuum when you crack the throttle. There's no vacuum there when it's idling, only when you crack the throttle. And the way they do that is they have the little vacuum port right close to the throttle plate. And so when you crack the throttle, it'll start getting vacuum in that port. Now that's the one I always like to hook up to the vacuum advance on the distributor. And you can take a car that didn't run all that great when it came out of the factory and move those vacuum lines around, you know. It's not hurting emissions or anything. But you move the vacuum lines around, you hook that ported vacuum to the distributor, and it would spin a tire. I mean, it would make all the difference in the world. If you crack a throttle, it advances the timing, and whoo, it just throws you back in the seat, you know. And uh, I've had it actually used to years ago, back in the 70s, I would do that when I was putting an engine back together. I'd route it like that instead of the other way. And they would say, man, I've never felt this car run that good since it was brand new. <laughs> but anyway, uh, people would tinker with the idle speed a little bit because they like to turn screws and watch stuff happen. Tinker with the idle speed. They get it where they're getting a little bit of that. But, but they had some temperature switches that were screwed into the water. They had vacuum hoses going through them. You may have seen them on some of the older cars. And those would keep the EGR from getting, I mean, the vacuum from getting to the EGR when the engine was cold. Well, he's tinkering with it when the choke is already open, but the engine ain't warm enough for the EGR to get anything yet. Turns the screw a little bit. People tinker with a car in a backyard. Then they drive it around. All of a sudden, it's, they notice it idling rough. And they fool with the carburetor. They can't get it not idle rough because they got EGR flowing now, don't you see? And so the guy goes to his buddy that knows a little more about cars than him, but just enough to be dangerous. And the guy unplugs the EGR valve and it smooths out. And he goes, hey, this is great. I'll just put a BB in that hose and stick it back on there, and I'll be good to go. So he does that. And then he starts noticing pinging because the EGR ain't working. So he said, gosh, I'm pinging now. So what am I going to do about that? So he goes back to his buddy that you know, put a BB in the EGR. And the guy says, well, I always just retard the timing a little bit whenever it pings. So he retards the timing. He stops it from pinging. And now the guy's driving the darn thing uh, and noticing that his gas mileage has gone to crap. He was getting 17, 18. Now he's getting 13, 14. He said, this is stupid. You know, I hate this emission stuff. I wish they had never put it on the car. So he finally goes down to the dealership or some shop where people know what they're doing. And the first thing they notice is that the timing ain't right. They set the timing and they hear it pinging. They say, well, it ought not to be pinging if everything's like it ought to be. And they know, so let's see if the EGR is working. Oh, that's why it's going to be in the hose. So they put it back like what? Well, and finally they say, why is the EGR flowing? Oh, he's, so -so, he's got the idle speed adjusted up. they got to undo everything he did, put it back like it was, and now he's good to go. And if he hadn't turned that screw and raised the idle speed a little bit, he'd been in Fat City. You know what I mean? You make trouble for yourself tinkering with something you don't understand. That's the point. You got me? All right. Now, that little story is pretty important because it illustrates the point. If you have to understand the whole system and you know, what causes what before you can fix something the way you're supposed to be fixed. You know, some people just, you know, jerk stuff loose and move lines around and, you know, all that kind of stuff, hoping it, hoping they'll, you know, fix something. Uh, let me see. Uh, exhaust cat. Let's see. Where am I at? Which one am I on? 21? Never mind. Exhaust gas recirculation is used to control what? 
huh? C, NOx. When testing an EGR uh, system for proper operation using a vacuum gauge, how much manifold vacuum, how much should the manifold vacuum drop in inches of mercury when the EGR is commanded on by a scan tool? Six to eight, it's gonna drop some. Uh, that's another way, that's a rationality check the computer uses some of them to see when the EGR is flowing. If it, if it commands EGR and it doesn't see a drop in engine vacuum, it knows that there's something rotten in Denmark. Technician A says positive crankcase ventilation systems use a valve or a fixed orifice to control the flow of fumes from the crankcase back into the intake system. That's what I was talking about earlier. That Jeep I had and some of the foreign cars would have just a little fixed orifice in the, in the uh, valve cover, you know, with a vacuum line going to it that actually is controlling that. Um, what happens if, incidentally, what happens if the PCV valve and the enclosure hose stop up? Pressure in a crankcase builds it blows all the daggum seals. And if you ever see one, somebody gives you to work on it, every seal on it is leaking. Rear main seal, valve covers, pan, you know, a time, a timing cover seal. If all the seals are leaking, you know, I've seen mechanics go in there and they'll replace all them seals. You know, they're really good at replacing seals, but they're not good at figuring out why did the seals blow to begin with. Oh, it's just an old engine. The seals all got hard. Well, all of them? Come on now. Uh, so I got one over there that was a phone company, I mean a uh, Coca-Cola bottling company van. It was a Chevrolet. And uh, so this guy had replaced everything on there. And then they wanted me to look at the, you know, tune-up part. It hadn't been maintained like it should have been. And the PCV system was completely clogged, and so was the air, uh, the closure hose, you know, filter and all that junk. And so when I fixed all that up, when you listen to this, let me tell you something about this PCV. You know the little closure hose I'm talking about that goes from, you know, the PCV valve's in one side of the engine. It's either in the front of the valve cover if it's a straight, or it's in one valve cover if it's a uh, uh, V. And then on the opposite corner of the engine, usually, you'll have the closure hose. And on that Ranger, it comes off of the filler neck on the oil, right? That little hose that's going over and it hooks into the air inlet tube. It's getting clean air out of there. Understand where I'm going? It also funnels, if the PCV stops up, it funnels that steam back in there and it's processed through the engine. However, if I got an engine idling, I should be able to pull that closure hose off and I should be able to put my finger over it and I should feel a little bit of vacuum there. If I pull that closure hose off and I see steam and stuff coming out when it's idling, then I got a problem. And that means the PCV system's not working like it should. And that's something that needs to be straightened out. Another problem with the PCV system not working is it sludges up the inside of the engine, something awful. And if that sludge gets in the bottom of the oil pan, it's going to clog up the pickup screen on the oil pump, and it's going to starve the engine, and you're going to be buying an engine. Somebody is. You know what I'm saying? I mean, is everybody together on this, right? If you ever pull an uh, intake off of a V8 engine and the valve cover, they found all kinds of sludge in there because you were having to work on it before the intake gasket and stuff in there. And so you kind of want to clean that sledge out. Well, if you disturb a lot of that sledge, and I kind of like to clean it out too, if you disturb a lot of that sledge, and I've done this before, I actually had to put a camshaft in a Buick one time. It was a little V6 Buick. And a camshaft had a rounded off lobe on the camshaft. So I had to put a camshaft in it. So I had to pull the, up, pull the intake, pull the rocker arm, you know, pull the valve cover, pull the rocker arms, you know, pull the front off the engine, pull that stupid camshaft out of there, you know, put another one back in there, put all that stuff back together, put it back in time, all that hogwash. And then I drove the car really where I had to be done with it, and all of a sudden I'm seeing the oil light come on when it's idling. Wasn't like that before, but all that sludge that I disturbed doing all my work got down in the oil pan. So I had to pull the oil pan off and clean the doggone oil pan out. You know what I mean? And that was always, that was a lot of fun on those old cars. But, you know, but anytime you're selling a job like that, camshaft, you know, anything is intrusive like that, where you got to do a lot of work and there's a lot of sludge in there, you got to tell them, you know, we're going to need to go ahead and desludge this engine you know, to keep you from having trouble later. Because if you do all this work and then it starts for oil and it goes to knocking, you know, they're liable to hang out on you. Even though you didn't direct, you know, you, you weren't negligent necessarily. But anyway, just keep that in mind. It's, everything, you know, there's a cause effect relationship for everything. Drop my marker. Okay, let me keep going here before y'all turn into a skeleton. Yeah. All right. This right here is, um, I know whenever I start, when I go off of the questions and I start telling one of these little illustrative stories, uh, Melissa is basically goes, puts her head down on the table. <laughs> or she did. Done that <laughs> you did that yesterday. Yeah. Yesterday well, she did. Yesterday yeah. Well, yeah. Well, well, hard, it ain't hard to do. All right. Let me see here. Oh, la, 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 la. What's the purpose of the secondary air injection system, which is also, see, they've given you a couple of different 
names for this, you know, like you got air injection reactor, secondary air injection. What's the purpose of the secondary injection system? What is it? Basically, A, pump air into the intake manifold. B, convert oxides of nitrogen to water. C, pump air into the exhaust manifold. D, pump hydrocarbons out of the tailpipe. <laughs> 24 is C, pump air into the exhaust manifold. Uh, you're going to get some water coming out the pipe, but it's not because you've converted oxides of nitrogen to it. All right, let's see. Um, well, we still got a minute or two before. Let's see, let me see right here. A hose connected from the check valve to the air injection reactor diverter valve is securely burned in a secondary air injection system. The cause of this problem could be what? B, defective check valve. We talked about that earlier. It's a similar question to the or the, the hose or the or that uh, valve could work. On those Jeeps, oh, and let me tell you something else. Uh, you have to be a tenacious, uh, wrench smart kind of a person to change some of these things. Well, sometimes those little pipes that those valves are hooked onto, and they'll have pipe thread on them, and they, but the little tube is not going to be very thick, and a lot of times it's going to be kind of rotted out, or it's going to be weak, and you got, you know, you may hold it with your big wrench and try to turn it with your other big wrench. Sometimes you have to replace that whole pipe because you just can't get that valve off there without destroying that pipe because that pipe's so thin and so weak, especially if it's old, it's kind of rusty on the inside. So, uh, you know, be prepared for that too, uh, but that thing needs to be fixed right. You ever know how you know how well it how it feels really good when you finally fixed one right mm -hmm. and it gets out of here and it's like it's supposed to be? Well, you kind of don't feel quite so good if you got it out of here and they can drive it, but you know it ain't quite right. You know that just feels not so good. And I was amazed that that um, O-ring y'all left out held the refrigerant as good as <laughs> it did, but that's just an easy mistake to make because you know. Anyway, but now you're going to know there's an O-ring close to the window every time. Um, let's see, PCV, positive crankcase ventilation system, controls which of these exhaust gases? CO, HC and CO, NOx or HC? What do you think? It's actually going to control hydrocarbons more than anything else. Uh, technician A says as much as 50% of the air needed by the engine speed at idle flow throws through, flows through the PCV valve uh, system. Technician B says the PCV tests include the rattle test, card test, snapback test, crankcase vacuum test. Uh, who's right? That's B, actually. Uh, I will tell you, remember what I was telling you the other day, whenever you're looking at your fuel trims. Your fuel trims are an indicator of how your uh, engine controller is interfacing with the oxygen sensors and what it's doing with the fuel in response to that. Uh, but the mass airflow is all, you know, factored in there, too. If, the, if something causes the fuel delivery to be out of balance, the oxygen sensor is going to pick that up. The engine controller is going to change the fuel trim based on what it sees the oxygen sensor indicating. Because what its whole job is, if there's any way possible, whatever we have to do, we need to keep this thing at 14.7 to 1. So we're going to subtract fuel, add fuel up to a point. It can take care of product variability and minor changes in the field. If it's bumping close to the edge of what it can do, that's when you start getting your trouble codes. But if you take the, uh, if it's got mass airflow and you pull the oil filler cap off, you're going to see the, uh, I talked about that the other day, you're going to see the uh, fuel trims walk into the high side because the PCV system is now going to be pulling unmetered air through the oil cap. So if somebody leaves the oil cap off, anyway, that's a bad practice. Found an oil cap laying in a parking lot the other day. I hope it's not one we left off. But I mean, people leave them off. If you, have you ever took an oil cap off and looked in that oil cap and you could see the timing chain? On some engines, you can actually see the timing chain when you take the oil cap off, like Volkswagen, uh, some of the older Volkswagens you could. The oil filler cap is right over the timing chain. If you leave the oil filler cap off one that's right over the timing chain, it will throw every bit of that oil out of that engine and it'll burn it up. And that's from leaving the oil filler cap off. You got me? So leaving the oil filler cap off is not a small deal. Also turn on check engine light too. Um, is that oh. right over the chain? Yeah, but if you, uh, well your timing chain is down there behind the, uh, you don't have overhead cam on yours, you get camshaft in the block on that 3100. Yeah, there's something, yeah, there's something in there. But anyway, um, Technician A says the secondary air injection system forces air at low pressure into the exhaust to reduce carbon monoxide and hydrocarbon exhaust emissions. Technician B says exhaust check valves are used between the air pump and the exhaust manifold to prevent exhaust gases from flowing into and causing damage to the air pump and valves. And that's number 28. That's Charlie. On some of your Volkswagens, the uh, air pump is mounted kind of low into the 
on the right side down there, as I remember, and it has a tendency to pick up water. And so sometimes it will fail because of water ingestion. The air that it's pumping, it's got to get from somewhere, doesn't it? And if it picks up a bunch of water because it's mounted too low and there's a lot of mist, like if the air pump's trying to work and there's mist from rain and all that, it'll ruin that air pump and those, uh, and those Volkswagen Passats. I know they've had some trouble with that. Okay, um, two technicians are discussing the catalytic converter. Technician A says the exhaust mixture must fluctuate between rich and lean for the best efficiency. Technician B says the air-fuel mixture must be leaner than 14.7 to 1 for best performance from a three-way catalytic converter. Three-way catalytic converter means it's handling all three gases, oxides of nitrogen, carbon monoxide, and hydrocarbon. All three of those are being handled. That's why, that's why on that uh, VECI label under the hood it says TWC, three-way catalyst. That means it's handling all three of those. Okay, so basically number 29 is going to be what? A, right? Yep. Okay, that's what your oxygen sensor is always going from rich to lean all the time, real quick. On vehicles with OBD2 diagnostics, the catalytic converter function is monitored using what? It's going to be B, pre and post converter oxygen sensors. That rear oxygen sensor should switch slow, and the front oxygen sensor should switch fast, if they're like they ought to be. Now, you're going to see a picture of that down here in a minute on this next page we're going on to. See the little camel humps down there? An enhanced evaporative control system can detect a leak as small as what? It's going to be B, 20 thousandths of an inch. I mentioned that earlier. A vehicle has a stored diagnostic trouble code, PO440, which is an evaporative system fault. The most common cause of this is, number 32, a loose gas cap. Now, some of these vehicles, like the Taurus that I'm driving right now, if I happen to leave, and I haven't left the gas cap off, but I happen to leave the gas cap off of that one after I fill it up, it's always watching the fuel level in the gas tank. You know, since it has to know if it's below, I mean, if it's between 15 and 85 percent, it's monitoring the fuel level. The engine controllers are monitoring the fuel level. And sometimes you'll get a code saying the fuel level indicator fault. And that means your gas gauge, you know, sending you this lousy, typically. But on the one that I got out there, if I leave the gas cap off, it's going to know whenever the last time I was switched off, the gas was low. The next time I crank it up, the gas is high. I have got a big evaporative leak now. So in my little PCM mind, I'm thinking, this knothead left his gas cap off. But on my car, not only does it throw this PO440 or PO455 code or whatever, it actually turns on a light on the dash. It's got a picture of a gas cap that's been left off. Have you seen those lights? It's actually a picture on the dash. It's got a picture of a gas cap that's not put on there. It proves out when you crank it up. And now, all right. Okay, uh, now incidentally, that was a 32 was A. This drawing shows a catalytic converter with exhaust gases entering the cat. What are the gases changed to at the cat outlet? What are the gases changed to at the cat outlet? And what do you got going in? What are the two gases you got going in? You got CO and you got hydrocarbon. Now, what's the catalytic going to do? To, to treat those. Catalytic converter, what's it going to do to treat those? I'm going to add one molecule of oxygen to my carbon monoxide, and that's, what's that's what, it, what, will it, what will it become then? Huh? O2, CO2. Then I'm going to add two molecules of oxygen to my hydrocarbons in there. Hmm? Yeah, what do you think about that? Everybody like that answer? It'll be both of them. All right, I'm going to turn it to A and C. Is that right? Okay. Now, water vapors don't come out of there, too. The oxygen sensors in this OBD2 system are sending a voltage signal as shown. And what conclusion can you get from that? Guys, if those things are switching the same speed like that, and the back one's not lazy, that's typically going to mean your oxygen, I mean, your catalytic converter is not storing oxygen the way it should. And usually it needs replaced. Now, occasionally, if it's, you know, fouled or something, sometimes you can clean the catalytic converter. It depends on what's wrong with it. But that's going to throw you a PO420 code. But let me tell you something else before I think, forget about it. Don't change the wrong catalytic converter for that. Because these oxygen sensors here, if, if you've got a PO420 code and you've got an oxygen sensor looking like this, 
uh, do not change the wrong cap. I had one, uh, the one that's really on a four-cylinder car, you got a manifold coming out of the head, right? All right, you got the catalytic converter right here, and then it goes on under the car, and there's another catalytic converter under here that's kind of long. Got me? I'm not drawing them where they look like a catalyst, but that's what they are. You'll have an oxygen sensor here. You'll have an oxygen sensor here. I have on more than one occasion seen people change this catalytic converter for a PO420 code when the one they needed to change was this one because these oxygen sensors have no idea what's going on down here. And your PO420 code was generated by this oxygen sensor and that one switching at the same speed. This is They put it right there coming out of the manifold because they want it to be really hot. Because heat is what makes a catalyst work. It needs to run about 1,700 to 2,000 degrees usually. All right, but this converter right here, you know, this thing does not even give a rip about that one. You know, it's, it's not even smelling of this one back here. Yeah, that one out there is not even being checked by anything. This one here is the one that they, that they consider all important. It needs to be checked all the time. And so, and this being your engine right here, got me? That's your engine. And you'll see that on a lot of four-cylinder cars. If you look down in front of that engine, on that four-cylinder, you'll see a, a big old round coffee can-sized catalytic converter. And below it, there will be an oxygen sensor. And above it, there will be an oxygen sensor. Those, that's the catalyst that needs to be replaced if you've got issues with that. I'll tell you something else these catalytic converters will do. They'll come apart on the inside, and they'll destroy an engine. Because EGR will get some of that uh, ceramic clay and recycle it through the, it'll just pick it up, you know, because it's rattling around all up in there. Mm -hmm. And it'll pick up that tube of that EGR, will pick it up. It'll go through EGR, goes into the intake, goes past the valves, gets down in there, and it just ruins the engine. That happened, that was pretty bad to happen on uh, some of the old Taurus SHOs and on Nissan Altimas. It would happen. Uh, so if you look, pull that oxygen sensor out, and you poke a boroscope in there, and you can see that that catalytic converter has started coming apart, then you best be putting a catalytic converter on there. You can buy one from the parts house. It's a bolt-on replacement. Uh, but uh, there's a lot more going on than emission control. It can destroy the engine, and it has done it a zillion times. Catalytic converters love to destroy the engine on those little out four-cylinder Altimas, you know, and I've seen it here. All right. Let's see. Do we have another question that I don't know about? That's it, isn't it? We done?